Wow, good morning. I got to tell you, I thought I was going to set the tone dressed the way I'm dressed. And apparently there was a memo that went out that I didn't know anything about. No, I'm just kidding. I could see everybody dressed like we're going to Hawaii or something. That's good stuff. Good to see everybody this morning. We're going to sing a few songs. It's communion and name tag Sunday. I'm excited to see everybody here this morning. If you can stand up and join with us, let's sing these songs. sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you our sacrifice. Sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you our sacrifices. I was, there are a number of these shirts I'm just blown away. Let's keep praising and worshiping. He is Lord. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead and He is Lord. this morning church let's worship it from our hearts thank you father God. we thank you for all you do for us we confess right now every tongue in this house that Jesus Christ let's sing it again hear our praise father communion in a few moments. Let's continue to worship in church.
It's okay to give him a clap offering. It certainly is. Father God, we do. We come here this morning to worship you. We thank you for all that you're already doing. Father God, we see your works happening right before our very eyes. Father God, I just thank you for that. Continue to bless and anoint this service. It's all for you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I tell you, you want to talk about the work of the Lord. You could be seated. Go ahead. You want to talk about the work of the Lord. I want to just go ahead and make mention. Sister Deanna Pedrick is back with us after months. Boy, if that don't get you fired up, warm the cockles of your heart, there's something wrong with your cockles. So get them, get them checked out, okay? It's good to see you, sister. Good to see Brother Jim. He's smiling from ear to ear. Look at him. That's good stuff right there. Well, we've got some announcements. We're going to take care of a little housekeeping, I like to call it. First of all, if you're a first-time visitor in our church, raise your hand. I wasn't back at the door today. We're doing communion, and I was looking at my notes and things like that. But if you're a first-time visitor, raise your hand. We don't want to make you feel awkward or embarrassed none well let's give it up for the lord then you know they may have been put off by my shirt we don't know about that yet (laughs) i want to remind everybody directly after church in the fellowship hall we'll be having a meeting for vacation bible school my brother bill he's doing a shameless plug hero headquarters (laughs) yeah that worked out good yeah, it's, a, it's an action-packed, fun-filled thing. We've got skits. And by the way, if, uh, if you get picked for a skit, practice is on the horizon. So get ready. Anyways, BBS uh, meeting right after church uh, for all those that have helped to sign up. Remember, that's, that's coming up July 10th, the week of July 10th, right? And it's 6 to 8.30, okay, Monday through Friday. And, uh, and then we'll have a program on Sunday. If, you've, if you can, mark off that time if you volunteered to be here with us in spirit and energy and zeal and all that good stuff. Uh, Wednesday will be Finger Food Fellowship. We got it right this time, right? <laughs> yeah. Bring a dish. Bring two dishes. Let's share them. It'd be a good time. Bring a friend, most importantly. You know, we got we to gotta spread the word. There's good news we got in this church. I'm fired up. I've been reading, and uh, I'm, I'm just really fired up. It's good to see everybody. Uh, adult Bible study Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., right over in the fellowship hall don't forget wednesday nights and pastor roger brought me a note here this monday tomorrow at june 6th bible study with pastor roger he's going to talk about the most needed thing in the church and the most neglected thing the power of the holy spirit so if you can be there that'd be a good bible study i'm sure if you do not pick up your directory last week please see jamie to get a copy of your directory i know uh a couple of you had come up and asked how we do that. Sister Jamie will make sure you get to the right place and pick that directory up. We also, again, later on, if, you, if you're tech savvy, if you're not tech savvy, whether it's Android or Apple phone, we can certainly get you with the app on the phone, and it's, it's extremely helpful. Um, it's handy. It's right there. You're going to make a phone call anyways. Bammo. You go right to the person you want to call, and you're on the phone instantly. There's still some items for VBS that are needed. Miss Jamie and her artistic impression has made us this, uh, this board in the back. And the way that board works is there's little tabs that kind of hang there. Take one of those off and then just kind of scratch your name behind. That way she knows who to keep accountable. This makes sure we don't get a redundance of things and we have everything we need for snack time and, and those sorts of things. Again, that's on the back table. If you feel led to do so, stop by and pick something up for us. It'd be mucho apreciado. Um, I want to remind everybody, Christmas meeting, Miss Cheryl, we said the 10th next Saturday. Okay, Trish was asking, and I was wondering, and a few others were un- wondering. So next Saturday at 10 a.m., we're going to talk Christmas. Yeah, it's already that time. Already that time. At this time, if we could call our ushers up, we'll go ahead and take up our, our offering. And uh, I want to thank everybody while they come for yesterday's service. It was... Uh, I talked to Sister Barbara Jones last night on the phone, and she watched in, and she just said, what a, what a beautiful service. And it really was not, not tooting our horns or, or patting ourselves on the back. We boast in Christ, you know, uh, and everybody uh, has said some wonderful things 
about the service that happened, even the committal service, all those that, that brought a dish, all those that helped out, uh, loving on a family that's uh, mourning the loss of a loved one. I, I can't thank you enough. I'm super grateful as a pastor. The more and more I learn um, the, the group that's behind me and supporting this church, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. So thank you, thank you, thank you from the Bass family. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you thankful, grateful for all the things that you do for us and, and provide for us. I thank you for such a loving congregation, such a generous congregation, Father. And I just ask now as we collect this offering, we do so with the right heart, Father. It's all for your glory. It's all for the furthering of your kingdom. We just ask now that you'd bless it and multiply it. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Till I lay my head I will see of the goodness of God If you know it, sing it with me All my life you have been faithful So, so good With every breath that I am made I will see of the goodness God's God, God's good, thank you Jesus I love your voice You have led me through the fire In my darkest night You were close like no other I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, I have lived in the goodness, I know some of you have too, let's sing it to him. All my life you have been faithful, all my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I am made able, I will see of the goodness. Let's sing that chorus again. All my life he's been faithful. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made. I will sing of the goodness of God. I like this bridge. Your goodness is running after, running after. Aren't you grateful? Thank you, Jesus. Your goodness is running after, running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after. I want to sing that again. Thank you, Jesus. Woo. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. My life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. Sing it nice and soft to me. All my life you have been faithful. Thank you, Jesus. All my life you have been so, so, so good. With every breath that I am made, I will sing of the goodness of God. Let's sing that chorus again. All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am made I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God 
glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You could be seated. We're going to sing. We're going to sing a hymn in the sweet by and by on that beautiful shore. You know, it was a it was a beautiful a beautiful uh, memorial funeral celebration of life with Sister Sylvia. You know, she's on that beautiful shore. Yes. To be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. She met him. She met him. We talked about a scripture at the, at the committal, and uh, Pastor Arlen shared it with us. He said, Jesus wept. He was weeping over the people that were mourning over Lazarus. And uh, I believe that he wept. It was shared with me, and I believed it. I, I thought, man, what a, good, what a good take on that. You know, he wept because those people had to experience loss. But I think he also wept because he had to send Lazarus back from eternity. He had experienced all of that beauty and had to send him back. So I believe he wept for that reason, too. We're going to sing this song if I can get it together. <laughs> In the sweet by and by. There's a land that is fairer than day And by faith we can see it afar For the Father waits so To prepare us a dwelling place In the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore. We shall sing on that beautiful shore the melodious songs of the blessed. And our spirit shall sorrow no more Not a sigh for the blessing of rest In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore to our bountiful Father above we will offer our tribute of praise for the glorious gift of His love and the blessings that hallow our days in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by. We shall meet. I want to sing that chorus one more time. In the sweet by and by. We shall meet on that beautiful shore. Thank you, Jesus. In the sweet. By and by, we shall be on that beautiful shore. Say that last line. We shall be on that beautiful shore. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Looking forward to that day. Don't want to go yet, but I'm certainly looking for that day. Amen. We're going to praise and worship the Lord. If you could do so now, you could stand up with us, sing, worship Him. That's what we came in here for. We're here to get fed, church. Oh, I will bless the name of Jesus, praise the name of Jesus, sing unto the King of Israel. Oh, I will bless the name of Jesus, praise the name of Jesus, sing unto the King of Israel. And I'll sing glory, glory, glory to his name forever glory 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 to his 
his name. Let's sing it again. Oh, I will bless the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Sing unto the King of Israel. Oh, I will bless the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Sing unto the King of Israel. And I'll sing glory, glory, glory to His name forever. Glory, glory, glory to His Let's take it one more time. Oh, I will bless the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Sing unto the King of Israel. Oh, I will bless the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Sing unto the King of Israel. And I sing glory, glory, glory to His name forever. Glory, glory, glory to His name. Finish it right there. Glory to His name. One more time. Glory to His name. Let it rain. Let it rain. Open the floodgates to heaven. Let it rain. Sing it with me, church. Let it rain. Open the floodgates to heaven. Let it rain. Let it rain. Open the floodgates to heaven. Rain on me. Rain on me. Let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all the peoples see his glory. Sing it with me. Let it rain. Let it rain. Let it rain. Let it rain. Open the floodgates to heaven. Rain on me. Rain on me. Send the rain. Send the rain. I stand to praise you, but I fall on my knees. My spirit is hungry, but my flesh is so weak. 
like the fire in my soul fan the flame make me whole Lord you know where I am so like the fire in my heart again sing that first verse I stand to praise you but I fall on my knees. Are you hungry this morning? My spirit is hungry, but my flesh is so weak. Come on, Father, light the fire. Light the fire in my soul. Fan the flame. in my heart again. Let's go on to that second verse. I feel your arms around me as the power of your healing begins. You breathe new life through me. Take a deep breath like a mighty rushing wind like the fire Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Light the fire in my soul. Fan the flame. Set us ablaze, Father God. Light it up. Light it up for us, Father. We thank you. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Even so, to take your bride away. How my soul longs to be with you, my Lord. Even so, thank you, Jesus. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Lord, you are. Lord, you are. You're the lover of my soul. Lord, you are. Exalted over all. And I bow. Before your throne to worship you. Lord, you are. Lord, you are. The love of I'm going to sing it again, church. Let's sing it to him this morning. Even so. Even so. Jesus, come, even so, to take your bride away, how my soul longs to be with you. Even 
stand in all of him church just want to stand in all of him he's so worthy a living God father God we just praise you so much this morning we just glorify you so much God you're God you're good you're good all the time just pray a special anointing over this service we love you father it's all for your glory in Jesus name we pray amen, amen. You can be seated. Thank you. I let him go. Is this on? Check one, two, is this thing on? Uh oh. Check, check, oh, there it is. I sent them walking and forgot to give them their communion. I'll give you a moment to get that communion cup out. It's a little double cellophane at the top, and I'll let you fumble with that for a second while I fumble with this microphone and get my stuff together. God's good, church. We serve a loving God, a merciful God. Remember that, that, that's got a clear cellophane that kind of, what happened? Did you get one? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry, Brother Steve's going to say something. I apologize. Had it all worked out. My okay, actually, I come back up here to get my iPad, but <laughs> as long as I'm here... I wanted to say mucho, because to some people that means a lot, and all of you people mean a lot to me, and I want to thank you for everything you did, and all the sympathy that you've shown, and it was a fantastic funeral, it was. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. You crying? Don't make me cry. No, I, I don't want to break the moment, church. We've, it was a wonderful praise and worship this morning always give our best to God when we we're in that moment that's what the that's what our mission is up here we pray for that in the morning we get together and we pray that we'll be able to lead you into a moment of worship and a moment of praise where we lift our hands and we praise the almighty God we're about to take communion when Christ ascended into heaven there are a lot of ways that he uh, I guess instituted you could say for us to remember him Partaking in the Lord's Supper or the communion is probably one of the most significant ways we're called to remember Christ and all of his gospel work. Paul was correcting the, the church at Corinth, and he reminds us of why we take communion. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. We're remembering the blood that he shed on Calvary. We're remembering 
the stripes that he took on his back. When God was, when Jesus was there with his disciples at the Last Supper, he used things that were there at the dinner. I'm sure they didn't have these little plastic cups <laughs> and the little wafers, but he took the elements that, they were, that were there. And I can imagine, I don't know how they cooked the, the bread back then or whatever, but I, you could imagine the stripes across that bread. And it would make you think of the stripes that he took for us. His broken body for us. Pierced his side and the water and the blood flowed for us. That's what Paul was reminding them at Corinth about. They had make a mess of it. There was this, all kinds of stuff going on that was in error. And he was correcting him for it. I want to read from the Matthew, book of Matthew. Excuse me. Chapter 26, verses 26 and 28, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. <clears throat> this is my body. And he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the many, for the remission of sins. You know, just like, I've said this before, just like we take... And we eat for our sustenance, for us to stay alive and healthy and, and hydrated. We should look at these elements as a, a, as a reliance on Christ for our spiritual life. I believe that's what's supposed to happen. As I'm talking here, I want you to examine yourself because Paul also goes on to warn them, telling them that they need to make sure that their heart's right as they take this cup. They drink this cup and they take this bread to make sure it's all at, at the cross. To do so would be an error. It says, but let a man examine himself. I'm reading 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 28, 29. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Again, he's warning them. This is a holy moment. This is a special moment, a time where we commune with the Lord. Go ahead and grab your, your wafer if you've had it out. I'm reading again from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23, 24. Paul writes, For I have received of the Lord that which is also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he had bet was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so aware of what you've done for us. We're so grateful for what you've done for us. You sent your one and only Son to die for those that would pull your beard out, that would press a crown of thorns on your head. We read the cost. We know what happened. And we just pray that you'll bless this communion, Father God. See it as a savory aroma as it goes up to you, Father God. We thank you for it. We ask now that you would bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take the bread. <clears throat> After the same manner, he also took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. Let's pray over this cup. Father God, we read the story and we know that the water and the blood flowed. It flowed for the remission of our sins, which makes it possible for us to share in this holy communion with you. Father God, I stand before you a grateful man, a redeemed man because of your son's blood. And I just pray that you bless this cup as we take it. We thank you for the things that are happening here. It's all for your glory. And in Jesus' name we say, amen. Let's drink the cup. I believe our ushers are going to come around. Please don't put these in the back of the, the seats, if you will. 
Brother Kip and Brother Neil, Bob and Jim, they're going to be making their way through the congregation. Let's go ahead and give those to them. time I blew my nose up here I ended up walking out with tissue all over my face so <laughs> yeah. it's just a tender heart that's all I tell them thank you Jesus thank you Jesus I want to read a, a word of scripture and then we'll pray and then I'll get into our lesson this morning I like this pulpit it kind of looks a lot like my desk I got everything everywhere. It's nice though. It's command central. I'm reading from the book of 2 Peter. I didn't give this one to you back there, Mike. Uh, Wendy, I apologize. I had it a different way. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, again, I come to you in prayer. Thankful for this, this holy communion that we've partaken in. I just ask now that you would bless and anoint this message. Speak through me. Give me the clarity that I need, Father God, in thinking. And, and just be at work here, Father. I'm just the vessel. I'm just the clay. You're the potter. And I just pray that you use me the way you want to use me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, I've talked about uh, the idea of grace here before. I did a sermon called The Results of Grace. Um, we all know, or most of us know, the biblical understanding or the, the, the meaning, the definition, whatever you like to call it, of grace is unmerited favor with God. Unmerited favor of God for, for people that are undeserving, maybe unlovable, restless at heart. Most of us have a pretty good idea of what grace is, and, and we know that it produces things in us. Things like graciousness we've talked about before. We change our attitude. Change your attitude to reflect God's mercy, God's love. There's also gratitude. It's a result of grace. You know, the, the more we realize the sin in our life and how much there was of it, we, we grow with a greater appreciation for, for God's grace, a greater gratitude for it. Not a gratitude eventually is expressed in a and a heartfelt appreciation, a love from your very core, a dependence on the source of that grace, which is God. We get a sense of peace. We get a sense of well-being because of that grace. And why do we have that? It's, it, is it because we have a nice home? You know, or are, we, are we strong and healthy physically? You know, we have money, those sorts of things. No, it's, it's not because of that. Those things wither away. One day you're well, the next day you're not. One day you have things, a couple that are, that, that's attending our church now, lost everything in the last hurricane and moved up this way. Here today and gone tomorrow. It's the grace of God that gives us that sense of peace and that well-being church. We also talked about the aroma of Christ. How do we smell to other people? A gracious heart and an attitude begins to, to be seen by others. It begins to be felt by others. They see it in, they see that you're led by Christ. They, they notice there's something different about us. Those people are weird. You were weird before you became a Christian. You're peculiar as a Christian, and we should be. They usually can't put their finger on it, but if they could put their finger on it, it's because it's, we're full of grace. That's what I'm talking about. It shows in our speech. It shows in the things that we say. It shows in our attitude, our actions. But there's one more thing I want to talk about this morning about grace. Um, grace should start to show in us a certain maturity and a certain growth. And I want to discuss some of the things. We've talked about the results of grace. I want to talk about some of the things that we learn 
because of grace in our experiences. Now, I've come up with four of them, and there may be more, for certainly, but I have four for you here this morning. My first one is grace teaches us to value the church. I'm talking about the body of Christ when I say that. I'm not talking about the brick and mortar. I'm not talking about the religiosity. I'm talking about the body of Christ. Grace teaches us to value that. You know, I began to make some observations as I talk with more and more people on the pastor side of things. And what I'm starting to learn is that people who misunderstand or unvalue or undervalue God's grace in their own lives typically don't see or seem to know the value of church or the need for church. Uh, maybe someone like that's very strong, self-reliant, you know, uh, not, they're not in touch with their sinfulness. People like that rarely see the need for church. They rarely see the need to, uh, to have church in their life of any sort. In fact, uh, Kimberly and I, they're the ones that are they're, they're like, oh, I'm good, I'm, I'm fine, I've got it all undercover. You know, I've, not, I've never done anything bad to anybody. I haven't stolen anything. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't done anything like that. I'm good. These people don't see their sinfulness. They don't feel a need to attend church. You know, the result of, of grace, if you think about it for a moment, it's the church. Again, I'm talking about the body of Christ. Grace works through Jesus Christ to ultimately produce what? To produce the church. It's the ultimate valuable thing. I was reading in Acts this week. Chapter 20 recounts Paul's third missionary journey. And I want to read to you verses 28 through 32. I'm reading from the NIV this morning. It says, keep watch over yourself. And you can hear when Paul, Paul had called for the elders at Ephesus, and he was, he was encouraging them and, and reminding them of certain things. But listen, when I read this scripture, listen to how valuable and important that Paul is telling him. 28 through 32 says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought, bought with his, with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Thieves don't break in to empty houses. Remember that. That's not in the scripture. That's a Rickism. <laughs> Thieves don't want what's in, a, in an empty house. He says, beware, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Paul's saying be on, it's valuable. Pay attention, be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit to you, to, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Christ, who was grace personified, said, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to, in Matthew 16, 18, he says, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The church built by Christ. The church built by grace. Jesus didn't build our church. He didn't build the church or a church he built his church the church is valuable because it's his church it's because where our works of grace and our experience of grace are carried out i wouldn't have known grace from watching tv i wouldn't have known grace to study the, all the philosophers over the last 200 years i wouldn't know grace if i watched Every, every movie made in Hollywood, pure flicks, whatever the case might be, none of those things would have taught me a, a lick about grace. Preaching the gospel taught me about grace. Not me preaching it, but hearing it from somebody else. That's what taught me. And that's done in church. It's done around church. It's done by the church. Again, we're talking about the body of us. We're ministers, every one of you. When you walk out that door, you know, the more I understand the depth and the meaning of God's grace, the more I appreciate the value. The more I appreciate the value. God's ultimate goal, I believe, was for the church with his grace, the body of Christ again. You know, I, Kim and I sat with a young man on Thursday. He came to work for us in the circus business. His name's Santana. 
a lot of the kids come and hung, hung out at our house, and we live rurally. And uh, when we were in the, the globe of death, Irma, the, the globo de la muerta, um, when we were in that business and in the show business, when you got one of those set up in your house, boy, a lot of people will show up. They'll show up and watch you practice. So we met these boys, and, oh, we want to go in the circus. We want to go on the road with you. So they would. We'd go. I'd, I'd make them uh, roustabouts. You guys may have heard that word somewhere. They were working men. They worked on my crew. I was the boss. And I, as I sat with him, you know, I was trying to witness, you know, just lightly, gently, not trying to beat him over the head with the Bible, but trying to express some things to him. And he says, you know, you ain't got to go to church to, to, to have God in your life. And I corrected him on that. You know, we're not to forsake our assemblies. We're, we are to come here to be lifted up. I was sharing with Sister Deanna. It was such a blessing. I was welling up just to see her here. Grateful for answered prayers, but grateful that she can be restored. And you all can love on her and let her know how much you've missed her. That's why it's important. But I, I, I got frustrated, and I didn't do anything unbecoming as I was talking to Santana. I didn't say anything that would have pushed him further away. But I get frustrated when I hear, especially young people, talk about, I don't need the church. Me and God, we got our own thing going on. Someone who says that really doesn't understand, really doesn't understand the importance of church. They don't understand God's grace, because that's what God's grace produced. The church is the experience of grace in the world, the experience of grace in the lost world. If you want to live uh, in that life of grace, live out your life in the church. Serve the church. Give to the church. Sacrifice for the church. Forgive those who offend you in the church. Teach somebody in the church. Go to a sick brother or sister and hold their hand and pray for them and tell them you miss them. And we want to see you back in church. We want to love on you. Pray with them. If you do these things, you learn about the grace of God. You know, it's the only place where you can learn about those kind of things, church. The second thing I found out was grace teaches us how to please God. In the last words of Peter's last epistle, he finishes with like this one last encouragement statement, if you will. And he's speaking to the church. And I read it as we opened up and prayed. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Now you, you could probably say when you read enough of the Bible and study enough of the Bible that, that Peter was the, one of those been there, done that kind of guys. You know? He was the apostle of the church and he's speaking to the church and he's giving them final words in this, in, in this last piece of Scripture. A final tidbit of wisdom. But before we look at that wisdom, I want to look at what, what Peter doesn't say. Peter doesn't say do more, talking to the church. He doesn't say work longer. He doesn't say try harder. He didn't say that. He could have, but I believe he didn't say it because I believe if he would have, that, that output kind of creates a, a religious pride. Output kind of creates that religious pride, especially if that's all you're focusing on. Activity without grace can cause us to compare ourselves to other, especially if it's not your gift to serve in a particular direction. If there's no grace in it, you can find yourself grumbling about, well, you know, I got here an hour earlier than that person. I've been cleaning and they didn't, whatever. If there's no grace in it, you see what I'm getting at, right? Activity alone is never satisfying because there's always more that you can do. You know, I, I feel sorry for the perfectionist. I feel sorry for the perfectionist that doesn't know Christ, I should say. They're never satisfied. It's, it's never good enough. They can never seem to please anybody or, uh, or themselves. They always kind of see what could be better. There's no sense of grace to that. I, I didn't want that life. I certainly don't. I and, and often feel sorry for that kind of person. What else doesn't Peter say in this passage? He's, he doesn't say, you know what? You should focus more on yourself. He doesn't say that. Make sure you focus on yourself. You know, I, you hear people talk about, I'm searching for myself, trying to find me. I'm lost, purpose, my inner self, I'm getting it together. Searching for yourself without Christ is futile, church. It's futile. I can't get all my ducks in the same pond, let alone in a row. 
It's futile. All you're going to find when you search for yourself without grace, without Christ rather, is, is an imperfect human being. You want to find, you know, I've heard, I got a buddy in the Marine Corps, Chris Sweeney. Uh, we were uh, tow gunners together. And he said when he got out of the service, he goes, man, I said this to, I think, Brother Chris and Nancy when I was back there visiting this morning. I said, you know, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I'm going to let my hair grow for a year. I ain't cutting it. You can't make me cut my hair. I'm going to let it grow. I haven't grown my hair yet. <laughs> but he went on to say, I'm going I'm to grow my hair out. He got him a VW bus, an old wooden guitar beat up from a pawn shop. He's like, I'm going across America. I'm going to find myself. You know, you, if you do that without Christ, you're going to find out who you are. You're going to find out you're imperfect when you get to California. You know? Peter didn't say, judge yourself. Oh, he didn't say, judge yourself. That includes some sort of measurement when we do that. How do we measure ourselves? At, at where do we set the standard? What would be good enough? What would be good enough to, to get to that level? There's no perfect 10 score. There's no, there's no perfect knowledge. There's no perfect repentance. We're our worst enemy. It's our human nature to judge ourselves and oftentimes judge others. And when we do, we usually find ourselves guilty. We're usually guilty. Then where do you go? Where do you go from there when you're doing it on your own? But Peter says some things in this short little scripture. I'm going to read it again. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. Peter's saying, grow in grace. Grow in the grace. The knowledge and the experience of God's grace. Grow in that. That's what he's saying. He's saying realize and understand how much God loves us. You know, it's just an opinion. But I believe there's one mistake that we make as Christians, and I'm going to generalize here. I believe that we usually underestimate God's love. You know, I, and it's, I'm early and new at it, early in my experience counseling fellow Christians who've got spiritual difficulties that show up in my office. Rarely the problem that they come to me with is they've overestimated God's love. That's usually never the problem. The problem is we underestimate his love. We say things like, God, how could God forgive me for that? How could God be patient enough with me when I've once again done the very same thing that I said I wouldn't do anymore? Why could God bless me if I continue to fail in an area where I so badly want to succeed spiritually? <clears throat> we need to see the power of God's grace. I was reading in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, he says, Paul's writing, he says, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Could somebody bring me a water, please? I'm really starting to get something in the back of my throat. <coughs> Thank you. Romans 8, 1 again. <coughs> Pardon me. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, I know Paul's writing in the book of Romans, but this is what Peter's talking about. This is what he's saying that we should grow in. Understand the idea that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He's saying grow strong in that. Dwell on those things. Re rejoice in it. Rely on it. Share it. <laughs> Share the wonderful news of grace with people. You know, live like a person that's in the power of that grace. Don't be afraid to be joyful. Don't be, a, don't be afraid and be confident in death. Don't be afraid of anybody or anybody, and certainly don't let anybody take that knowledge and that grace from you, that confidence. Grow in the knowledge of grace itself, Peter says. Not just grow in grace, but grow in the knowledge of that grace. That way you can share it with somebody. People are hungry for the power of God's grace in their lives, church. You could, you, I, I hear people all the time tell me they're broken, and they're hurting, and they're struggling. We need to be able to teach that to other people. We need to be able to convey that and share about this gift. When we talk, 
I've talked plenty of times from here, and I've talked to many of you, and I'm like, we need to do something outreach. I just posted on Facebook how I'm, I'm, I'm talking to some of my people BC, before Christ, in circus business, seeing if I can maybe put together some sort of a fall festival, create some excitement, show up in the neighborhood. We've got communities everywhere. Get families here and all those sorts of things because they need to hear the Word of God. I don't know how I'll do it yet. There's a lot of things to, to talk about, a lot of T's to cross and I's to dot. But we need to share that wonderful news. We need to grow in it and have the knowledge of it. You know, when you talk about the need to evangelize, usually inside of us there's this collective, oh no, i got to talk to somebody. i got to tell somebody about Jesus. I'm no good talking to people. I'm kind of, you know, introverted, shy. It's not talking about Jesus, church. It's not just talking about Jesus. It's about lifting that burden of guilt with them. It's sharing things that helps them get stuff off of their shoulders and off of their heart. Giving them hope. Why? Because there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. We just read it. You know, if you talk to somebody long enough, if you talk to somebody long enough and honest enough, they'll eventually get around to the idea about themselves. Love you, Brother Neil. Thank you, sir. Pardon me, everybody. If you talk to somebody long enough and honestly enough, they eventually come around to this feeling of, I'm no good. I'm no good. I'm not a good person. How many people have you ever talked to that have said, uh, you know, there's no point in me coming to church. God's given up on me. I got a, I got a friend that I invited to church. He's like, oh, you don't want me going there. We'll burn down the building. Because he's so steeped in his lifestyle. These people have this mentality of, I'm too bad. I'm, not, I'm too unworthy. I'm a, I'm a thief. I've been unfaithful. I'm a cheat. I did time in jail. I was in the military and had to do things that I regret. I feel guilty about it. I left my wife. I abandoned my kids. I'm not confessing anything here. <laughs> I'm, I'm giving you examples. Some of you got eyes about that big. You're like, oh, maybe he is the wrong guy. <laughs> They have this mentality of, how could God love me? We got good news for those people, church. We got real good news for them. It's not just one, two, three, confess Jesus Christ. You know, I know that God raised him, repent, be baptized. Of I mean, of course you do all that kind of stuff. But it's about, but friend, but neighbor, but honey, but daughter, but son. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. They'll, ta they'll say things like, how could that possibly be? So I couldn't forgive anybody that did any of those things to me. And I would say, yeah, but you don't know my Jesus. You don't know the God. You don't know grace. And let me tell you about that. Let me tell you about those things. That's preaching the gospel, church. Grow in the ability to administer the gospel of grace, not the gospel of love, or law, excuse me. Certainly there's love. You want to love all over them. Peter's suggesting that we grow in the knowledge of Christ himself. And I don't nearly, merely mean just facts and tidbits of the Bible that you know that you could drop and look knowledgeable when you're amongst the crowd. But grow in the dependence on him. When we say we know Jesus, it's not about all the doctrines. It's, it, it's, when I say I know Jesus, it's I depend on Jesus. I depend on Him. That's the opposite of everything that this world strives for. This world strives to be independent. We don't need anything. I want to have as many resources as I can so I don't have to depend on anybody. In Christ, it's the exact opposite of that church. The more mature I become, the more I grow in my faith, the more I depend on Him.
and the less I depend on me. Real growth takes place when we begin to rely on the Lord. Real growth takes place when we rely on His grace more and more and not just know the doctrines. And I'm learning a whole lot more about this self, myself. As I grow older, I realize that I'm less needed. Uh, I can do less. And I know some of you are like, you're 53! <laughs> just hang on! <laughs> some of you have told me. I'm like, woo, can't wait. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for encouraging me. No, but really, uh, it, it becomes, it's not just a point in my sermon, the point I'm making. It's starting to become a reality for me, as, as many it has for you. But grace is steady. His grace is steady, church. Even though our service is declining, even our, our strength and our ability is starting to dwindle, His grace remains the same. It's steady. It's always present. Grace teaches us to please God. It deepens our appreciation for His grace in our, in our lives. Sharing that with others enables us to draw closer to, to Him. We get excited about it. We get excited in the Lord. We have a more personal relationship with Him. God wants that. Well, I think sometimes we approach things like that thinking that God's mean and spiteful and just wants to, to, to oppress us. No, that's not what He wants. He wants to love on you. He wants a sincere relationship. He wants you to depend on Him. Not be a slave not be a slave and afraid of him. Knowing God, God's grace, it helps us to please him. The third thing I have that grace teaches us as we learn, it teaches us to suffer. Jesus was answering Paul concerning his suffering, the thorn in his flesh, and he says to him in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, he says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. You know, Paul was a man of action. You, re you read the history on Paul. He was a man of results, man. He was given marching orders. Go get him. Persecute him. Get him out of here. He got stuff done. He wanted to destroy every Christian he could. And when he, when he became a Christian, he was a man of results too. He wanted every soul to be saved by saving grace. You know, there was many times that Paul was, was in his ministry. He was delayed. He was defeated. He was weakened. He was opposed. His, his, the desired results that he wanted were watered down or they were totally denied completely. He wanted to go west. He was told, go east. God provided grace during those times. It enabled him to suffer the setbacks and the trials, and not lose his hope, his faith, and his love. Grace doesn't mean we don't suffer, church. Grace doesn't mean everything goes your way when you want it to go. That's not grace. Grace is what helps get you through that stuff. When the roof caves in, when, when your house gets blown over by a hurricane, when you feel abandoned, when you pray for a spouse that doesn't come to church with you, it's those things that grace gets you through. Only grace does that. It enables us to suffer without losing faith in our hope and our love. You know, unbelievers can, can suffer, and they do it collected, kind of stoically, if you will, but I, I, I don't believe that they have the, the faith and the hope and the love that grace gives us. In addition to teaching and enabling him to suffer, God also taught Paul that in the end, grace is going to be good enough. It would be sufficient, be sufficient to please God and come to God. It was probably difficult for a proud, <clears throat> active, task-oriented guy like, like Paul to accept that. I think about that. It's, and it's hard for any work-oriented person to accept that grace is enough. But, but God will teach that lesson to us if we allow him. And the last thing I have, I'm doing good. I'm going to go back to the middle and start again. <laughs> I think I missed something. No. Grace teaches us our, our duty. You know, as we study, um, as I study, the, I start to see a flow. I see a theme the different books have. You can find that 
information out and stuff. And you start to see a flow of information, like for, for Romans. Like the first 11 chapters, Paul is teaching uh, the doctrines. There's, there's, the, there's the doctrine. He's talking about universal sin, salvation by faith. He's talking about the process of sanctification and so on and so forth. In the second part of that, if you will, the, the last remaining chapters, he, he talks about the, the Christian duty in church and the way we're to handle ourselves in the world. Paul's teaching the readers what they need to be doing. You've got to read it and study it to know what we've got to be doing and be doing it. In Titus, he says it. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 12 it says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all the people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Grace comes in the form of Christ offering salvation and, and justification by a faith in Jesus. We rely on Jesus. That's a revelation. It's, it's, that's the doctrine. That's the gospel. That's the good news. But it, grace teaches us more. It teaches us our duty, our responsibility as Christians. We're saved by the power of grace, but if it didn't have the, the, the power to, to make us live a more righteous life, what good would it be? We'd just be returning to the old sin that we had lived in for so long. We'd be lost forever. Grace does more than that. It, it, grace in, enables us to live righteously and it gives us the information that we need to, to live a righteous life. Helps us deny ungodliness, deny worldly lusts, instructs us the way that we should live. You know, when I got saved years ago and then even now I've, I've got a lot of zeal for doing things, I have to pace myself keep having pastors that I look up tell me, get help, and I'm starting to learn that stuff. But when I got saved, I wanted to do what God wanted me to do. I want to do what God wants me to do right now. That's the point. That's the point of it all. Have you ever prayed for that? God, just tell me what to do. I don't know. I don't know what, what I should, should I, should I take this job? Should I not take this job? Just show me. Because we're like that. You know, we, 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 grace teaches us to obey and we want to, but we don't always know how. We don't always know how. Jesus himself says in John 14, 23, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. You say you love Jesus, but do you obey him? Book of John, chapter 14, 15 says, If you love me, keep my commands. You can read the Bible. There is so much disobedience of God's people in all the history. and You read it through the Old Testament, the New Testament. People struggle with this. They struggle with obedience. But grace teaches us to obey God. Some will say, well, how does it teach us? Well, it teaches us to obey with love. He, God provided us a, uh, an example of love. It says it right here, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that who would ever believe it would never perish. Our, 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 our obedience is motivated not by fear or self-interest. It's motivated by the love, a love that's so great, uh, of, uh, filled with gratitude for what He's done for us. You know, we're tempted. What I mean by grace is you get tempted and you think, oh, man, I, I'm going to, for me, pick up a drink. If I'm being honest. He'll say, are you really going to do that to the God that you love? To the God that loves you? How could you do that? You're being taught. Grace also provides the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.15, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. We're children of God. The Holy Spirit lives within us. We can call on that true Father. We can call on him in a time of need. When I say, God, please help me do the right thing, please help me resist 
Please let me drive by this convenience store. We're not just talking to the air. We're talking to a true and a living God. We're able to obey because we're in that family. We're heirs to the throne. We have an indwelling of that Holy Spirit. So we have the power to come. How do I know that? It's not because I had a cool cross of clouds that formed over my house. My heart started... Those are wonderful blessings when you receive them from the Holy Spirit. When you feel like the Spirit of God's moving through you. When you talk about Pentecostals getting slain in the Spirit. Visit them over next door. The Tabernacle de Adoracion. They get blessed with the Holy Spirit. How do I know? How do I know that the, the grace and, and, and I'm, I'm the pow- I have the power to overcome from the Holy Spirit? Because the Bible says... Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. This is Acts 2.38, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. If we just open up the Bible and read it, we, and remember, when we confessed and said, I believe that Jesus is Lord, I believe that God raised him from the dead, I've repented of my sins, and I got baptized, that's it. I put those things together, I get confident, church. I get confidence and I get at peace. Grace teaches me by providing the will of the Father. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I know the will of the Lord. I know where and what he he directs me to do when you're spending time with him. What's the uh, the amazing grace? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. But now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Thank you, Lord. I know a lot of people don't like mixing these two ideas, grace and obedience, um, because we start getting confused and it gets muddled with the idea of works. But here here it is. I'm going to explain it in a nutshell. Works is the effort to try to please God by doing things and giving him things, good deeds, Obedience is the effort to please God because of what he's given to us. Amen. It's because what he's given to us. There's a huge difference. Grace teaches us how to respond to this free and this priceless gift through faith in Jesus. It's easy to see what we do here. Our Christianity our, it is a bunch of don't do this, don't do that. It, much of our church experiences. Christian in, in Christian, re, Christian religion, excuse me, is, is about going to church. It's about acts of service. It's about prayer meetings, Bible studies, all the other different church things that we do. And those are all necessary. All those are wonderful things and necessary. We're, we are to be God's hands and feet. We are to be the, the light and the salt. We're to assemble and encourage each other to support one another. But we need to remember to let that grace that initially drew us, that grace that eventually drawed us, we need to let that teach us about what God has for us, that love and and, and that serving attitude. I want to summarize and, and then we'll be done. Grace teaches us to love and care for the body of Christ. Grace teaches us to make pleasing God in our everyday lives a priority. Grace teaches us to bear patiently under all the trials and tribulations that we have in this life, all the suffering, and do it with success. It teaches us what we need to do and what we need to eliminate from our lives to please God. And it teaches us to have an obedient attitude which is that aroma of Christ we talk about. Despite the hectic pace of this world, despite the, the, the downward spiral, grace teaches us these things, and we can find peace in that church. We can find satisfaction, comfort in those things. Faith expressed through repentance and baptism puts us in a relationship with Christ with Jesus and and all the blessings that are found with him. In Galatians 3.26, Paul says, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. 
For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. I want to encourage you this morning to stop putting it off. Stop putting off the, the desire to let God uh, fully overflow you with His grace and mercy if you're not there. If you're listening out there. If you've fallen off the bandwagon, I want to encourage you to respond to it. Return to the Lord. Get back into that grace. If you've rejected it, don't reject it any longer, church. It'll, it'll instill in you a, a, a love and a faith and a confidence that'll, that'll get you through. I love you. God loves you. He wants you to experience that grace here. We've got a wonderful... I was talking to Pastor Roger. He goes, you know, we, we know the destination. Now, I'm not stealing his material. But we know the destination. There's a lot to do in the journey. We've got a lot to do in the journey, and that's what we need to be considering and thinking about. If you would stand, I want to I pray and be dismissed. But I don't want to just let you go. We're, we're getting a little bit more organized up here. I'm sure you've heard the, the wonderful difference in the sound of the music and everything that's changing. It's, it's really starting to morph into a, a really good place. And, and eventually we'll, we'll, we'll get back to an invitation call, a, 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 a song of encouragement to get on your knees and pray for the grace that we're talking about to get on your knees and ask God to forgive you if you've grown cold. But that can still happen now. Nobody's got to know what you're up here praying for. Nobody's got to know. Just you and God. Let's bow our heads. Be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for this church. I thank you for what grace teaches us, Father God. And I pray that the things that you've allowed me to say here to this beautiful family of ours, that they apply it to their life, that they grow in that grace. Not just grow in grace, but grow in the knowledge of it and share it with others and the importance of it and what it could do to change their life tremendously. Only you can do that, Father. And that's what I pray here. I pray that over this entire congregation. I pray that you tug on someone's heartstrings right now as they hold on to the back of that chair. I pray that you work on them. Work on them good, Father. I pray and thank you for everything that's happened here this morning. I love you so much. I'm so grateful for all that you've done in my life. And I know these people are grateful for the things you've done in their life. Bless us and heal us. Father God, bless this nation. So many things going on. Be with us as we leave here today, Father God. Keep us safe on these roads. We love you. Everybody said amen. 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 Thank you. You could be... Dis- yes, sir. Yeah. For those of you who'd like to stay, if you, if you need to be dismissed and go, I understand. But Brother Al brought up a good, good point. They've actually taken the Bible out of the library for kids. Um, this is terrible. I mean, and it, the, the, I'm not going to jump on any political bandwagon, but the liberals are saying, okay, you want to take all the other stuff off the Bible? Well, right back at you. So the devil may feel like he's won the, this little battle, but he's not going to win the war. So let's pray one more time, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, I th-